After Martin Luther tacked up the 95 Theses on the castle church door at Wittenberg, the Reformation was off and running, but it was a few years later that the great watershed event took place when an imperial diet was called in the city of Worms, and Luther was summoned to appear before the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and also the princes of the church to defend his teachings. And while he was there, he was called upon, indeed commanded, to recant of his views. To which Luther replied, unless I'm convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I can't recant. For my conscience is held captive by the word of God and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. The crowd erupted at that moment. Luther was whisked away by his friends to the Wartburg Castle where he began the undertaking of translating the Bible into the German language, making the Bible available to the common person. In the Middle Ages, the Bible was literally chained to the lecterns of the churches so that only scholars who could read Latin and Greek and Hebrew had access to the pages of the Word of God. In fact, those who sought to translate the Bible into the common language in many cases paid for it with their lives. The Reformation spread beyond Germany to France, to England, and people in England who embraced the truths of the Reformation, were subjected to the persecution of Bloody Mary, and they fled for refuge to Geneva, Switzerland. Were there with John Knox and John Calvin and Theodore Beza. They undertook the project of translating the Bible into English, standing on the shoulders of those that went before them, on the shoulders of Wycliffe and Tyndale. They brought a new translation into English along with explanatory notes that would help the layperson understand the text of Scripture. That was the Geneva Bible, the Bible of Shakespeare, the Bible that was brought to the shores of America by the pilgrims on the Mayflower. It was the first English Bible that was used in this country. Now, during the Reformation, the motto of the Reformers was this, post Tenebras looks, after darkness, light. They realized that in the Middle Ages, the light of the gospel had suffered an eclipse that had been hidden from the view of the common people. But now, with Bibles in the language of the people, that light was restored for all who could read. Today, that's, that's our legacy. And we have the same challenge to our generation to see to it that the light of the truth of God is never again obscured or put into eclipse, but that we may work to make sure that that light shines into every corner of our land. Several years ago, I had some publishers approach me with an idea that I thought was fantastic. They said, there's so many study Bibles available in the bookstores, but there's none out there that present the understanding of the scriptures from the viewpoint and perspective of the historic Protestant Reformation. And so we agreed on a project where I would become the general editor and we assembled together a team of over 50 scholars to work on each book of the Bible to provide study notes from the perspective of Reformed theology. In addition to that, we had sidebars written that would explain the doctrines of grace for the layperson who was using that Bible. And initially, it came out in the New King James Version under the title of the New Geneva Study Bible. Later edition, it was named the Reformation Study Bible. And now we're launching a new version of the Reformation Study Bible in the ESV translation. That means we have two editions of the Reformation Study Bible, the NKJ and the ESV, which thrills my soul.
The magisterial reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, were both world-class technical scholars. They had been highly trained in the ancient languages and in linguistics, and both of them had been influenced by the flow of the Renaissance, which had the motto, ad fontes, to the sources. And that was their passion, to get back to the sources, the sources of scripture themselves, and move from there to make their case for reformation. They were not satisfied with being ivory-towered scholars. They wanted something more. Both Luther and Calvin had a passion to get the message of the Reformation to the people. Because they were convinced that the scriptures were nothing less than the veritable word of God. And they also understood that all of the programs that the church can conceive of and all of the activities that we're engaged in humanly will not bring revival until or unless the Holy Spirit accompanies the preaching and teaching of the pure Word of God. It was to that end that they dedicated themselves to accurate presentation of the Bible, that the Spirit would use it to bring revival. Revival just isn't enough. We need more than that. We need to go beyond revival, new life, to reformation. What reformation means are new forms, new structures, and that's what happened in the 16th century when that plowboy set up his Bible on his plow. His life was changed, his farm was changed, his community was changed. The scriptures were let loose like a roaring lion, and it began to impact the arts, politics, the church, family. Every aspect of the culture was renewed. And that's what our hope is now, that the darkness of our age will give way to the light of the Scriptures.